Thank you. I'd like to start this talk by uh, calling on a friend to help me make a specific point. This is Kevin. Hello, y'all. How are you doing? Now, in, in ventriloquism, most of us are familiar with uh, hearing words and seeing the puppet's lips move at the same time. Yeah, like this. Thanks. And, uh, and, and yet, in, uh, ventriloquists use a great range of tricks to help uh, maximize the illusion. For example, the puppet looks attentively around the room. Hey, you, what are you looking at? <laughs> you should be more polite, Kevin. Oh, sorry. Been in that suitcase so long, you know, I get kind of cranky. Thanks. Uh, he, he, he has a different tone of voice for me. He has a different uh, personality for me. So uh, I'm usually quiet and polite. Kevin is much more likely, therefore, to be ribald and, and crude. Crude? I'm not crude. You're crude. Well, how, how am I crude? You're the one with your hand up my backside. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean for him to be that crude. <laughs> okay, so the point is that to demonstrate the incredible efficacy of the machinery in your brains that attributes awareness to this object, you know cognitively there's no brain in there, but you can't help uh, the illusion of consciousness emanating from his head. Yeah, I don't have a brain, but I'm conscious. <laughs> what does that do to your theory? <laughs> okay, that's enough. I think that, what? What are you doing? Ow, stop! <laughs> He's okay. He's just uh, those noises that he, he he makes those noises at the end just to mess with you. But he's he's sleeping now. This talk covers three topics. Uh, the first topic is how the human brain might attribute the property of awareness to other people. Oops. Let's go back up there. The second, uh, oh, I see what's going on here. The second uh, topic is how the human brain might attribute the property of awareness to itself. Um, I'll make the suggestion that similar machinery in the brain is engaged in both cases. And third, I'll speculate about how a mere computing mechanism attributing a property to itself can possibly be responsible for an inner experience. Kevin is aware of the object. We call him Kevin, too, in honor of the orangutan. His awareness is obvious to most people. This picture gives us three uh, standard cues to Kevin's state of awareness. First, there's a salient object uh, near him. That information, uh, that's an informative cue. Based on that alone, chances are he's attending to the object. Uh, second, he's looking at it. And third, his facial expression is appropriate to the object. So something in the human brain is able to integrate multiple cues uh, and on that basis reconstruct Kevin's state of attention to attribute awareness to him.
There's another example. Again, Kevin seems to be aware of the object. A, a great deal of work has been done on this topic, sometimes called social attention. Uh, and almost all work on social attention focuses on the eyes. Specialized areas in the brain compute the direction of someone else's gaze. I'd like to point out here that the eyes provide only one cue. It's an important cue, uh, but we typically integrate many cues to construct a deeper property, uh, uh, someone else's state of attention. Here's an example of looking one place but attending somewhere else. Let me give you a backstory to explain this cartoon. Kevin and John um, are in the park talking about a news item Apparently, a tiger escaped from the local zoo. Suddenly, a tiger roars from the bushes uh, directly behind Kevin. And this picture shows their reactions. Now, is Kevin paying more attention to the tiger behind him or to the coffee spill in front of him? Probably the tiger. At this instant, uh, Kevin may be hyper aware of the space behind him. In this case, where Kevin is looking, uh, has nothing to do with his attention. Computing gaze direction is not always the same as computing someone else's state of attention. Other cues, such as your knowledge of the situation, uh, help, you, uh, help to inform you about the state of his attention. So let me plod through the details here. Here's how attention works physiologically. Signals in the brain compete with each other. And the signal with the biggest boost will tend to outcompete and suppress other signals. Even a coffee spill, normally an attention-grabbing event, uh, will probably be outcompeted by the tiger roar. Having won the attentional competition, the tiger stimulus uh, has um, such high signal strength that it will probably drive Kevin's behavioral planning. So he's unlikely to kneel down and help John mop up the coffee spill. He's much more likely to run. Uh, and to understand this picture intuitively, nobody needs to plod through the technical details of signal competition. Most of us intuitively understand attention. We can tap into a rich internal model of attention, of its dynamics, of its probable effect on behavior. That internally generated model allows us to understand and make predictions about Kevin. In my lab, we've proposed that the human brain uh, computes uh, something we've called an attention schema, a complex, sophisticated model of attention of what it means for a brain to focus its processing on a particular item. That model takes in information uh, from many sources. Well, it could be that Kevin is attending to a smell, you know, in which case eye position gives little help. Uh, other cues allow us to reconstruct Kevin's attention. Uh, or it could be that Kevin is attending to a thought, an idea, in which case we may cue into his speech or his facial expression or our prior knowledge about him. A blind person uh, talking to someone else can reconstruct something about that person's state of attention. In that case, uh, with a blind person, visual cues are missing entirely. But the attention schema could still be computed. That is, the blind person can still understand, ah, Kevin is paying attention to X. Can we find a computing system in the brain that integrates many cues in order to construct a deeper model of someone else's attention? We did an experiment to try to get at that. We used fMRI to scan the brains of volunteers. The task was simple. As you lie in a scanner, first you see a cross. Uh, you fixate on it for half a second. Then you see an object for one second, and you're allowed to look at it. Then you see a um, cross again and fixate on it for half a second again. And then you see Kevin's face. This face is present for two seconds, just a face with eyes and an expression. Your task, how aware is Kevin of the object that was over here. The scale is one, two, or three. One means not at all aware. Three means very aware. You press buttons. How aware is Kevin of the object? That's the simple task, trial after trial. One trial every seven seconds, 320 trials in a scan session. Um, a unique object is presented on each trial. 
Sometimes the object is nasty, sometimes nice. Sometimes Kevin looks distressed, sometimes he looks content. Uh, sometimes the object is on the left and sometimes on the right, and sometimes Kevin looks to the left or the right. All these possibilities are crossed with each other. Everything is counterbalanced. In the end, the task comes down to looking at this face, integrating the available cues, and intuiting how much awareness of the object is present in Kevin. The trials can be grouped into four categories. In this first condition, uh, whether the object is on the left or the right, Kevin is looking toward it. His gaze matches the object. Uh, in addition, whether the object is nasty or nice, his facial expression matches it. Now, suppose you had a brain area involved in integrating these cues. Here, the cues uh, are easy to integrate because they're all aligned. By hypothesis, that brain mechanism should have an easy time here. In this condition, his gaze matches. He's looking in the direction of the object, but his expression mismatches. He's smiling at a nasty object, or he seems horrified at a nice object. Uh, by hypothesis, a brain region involved in uh, trying to weigh these partially misaligned cues has more work to do to try to fit the cues together, to try to compute Kevin's state of awareness. It has, work, it has to work harder to answer the question and should be more active here than here. These bars show the predicted level of activity. Likewise, in this third uh, and fourth conditions, a brain region involved in integrating the cues, the misaligned cues, uh, has more work to do and should be more active. The key to this logic is to remember that we're looking for a cue integration engine. Only in this condition are all the cues aligned. In the other condition, the cues are variously misaligned. Therefore, the cue integration engine should show this distinctive pattern of activity, low, high, high, high. This is data from an example subject. Uh, what you see is the right hemisphere. The blue uh, shows the region of cortex in which the signals showed a significant match uh, to the predicted pattern. In this subject, only a restricted region of cortex shows up in this test. Uh, a lot of cortex is buried in sulci, and a standard way to view the cortex better is to inflate it. The 3D model uh, of the cortex is inflated like a balloon. And you can see more clearly, we're looking more or less at a restricted uh, area of cortex. This graph shows the activity from this area of cortex. Just to be clear for those not entirely familiar with the method, fMRI measures the amount of oxygenated blood that flows into a brain area. When an area of the brain increases its electrical activity after several seconds, there's a corresponding rise in blood flow. Kevin's face appears during this time, so this is time on this axis. Kevin's face appears here. Uh, the signal, uh, and, and these traces show the signal over the course of several seconds. The signal is an average of 80 trials per condition. Here you see the conditions where the cues were misaligned. Uh, figuring out Kevin's state of awareness requires weighing misaligned cues, and the activity rises up. This line shows uh, the 80 trials when all the cues are aligned, when cue integration requires less work and the activity drops low. What's probably happening here is that uh, in the rapid succession of trials, uh, this brain area maintains an overall high oxygenated blood level. It's just beginning to come down from the prior trial and then it's kicked up again by the next trial. Um, but a trial type comes along that doesn't require as much processing and the signal can uh, drop down. So this region of the brain matches the predictions. It acts as though it were integrating the appropriate cues in order to answer the question. It acts as though it were computing Kevin's level of awareness. Here's the left hemisphere from the same subject. A bit more scattered activity, some in the frontal lobe, which we often find but a similar clump back here. This finding is typical. We find it consistently across subjects. 
We've tested 10 subjects so far. This pattern is so statistically strong, it shows up uh, clearly in each individual subject. We don't need to average across brains for the results to emerge. Something back here seems to be integrating cues to compute the answer to the question, is Kevin aware of thing X? In some ways, this finding is not surprising. This region back here is called the temporoparietal junction. TPJ, it's been shown many times to be active uh, during social thinking. Here we have a specific example of social thinking. But let's consider the possibilities more closely. Previous experiments have looked at how we monitor other people's gaze. Uh, and gaze monitoring by itself seems to activate more this region in the superior temporal sulcus. Previous experiments have also looked at the perception of facial expression. For that, the activity is uh, often in the superior temporal sulcus, in the temporal pole, in a variety of other areas. Faces in general tend to activate the fusiform face area. But the present experiment does not focus on gaze monitoring by itself or facial expression uh, by itself. What's critical here is integrating cues in order to construct a deeper property, the awareness that's attributed to Kevin. One of the now classic findings about the TPJ from Rebecca Sachs involves the uh, false belief task. I won't go into the details. But if you are in a scanner, <clears throat> if you're in a scanner and you think about the beliefs of other people, the cognitive ideas that are in other people's heads, uh, then the TPJ tends to light up. Uh, but here we don't have any evidence that the subjects are actively reconstructing Kevin's beliefs or ideas. We even ask subjects afterward. They don't report, well, I tried to figure out if Kevin believed he could put out the fire. Uh, no, people are glancing at the face, intuiting Kevin's state of awareness, and snap responding uh, within a latency of about one second. This idea I'm suggesting, that the TPJ helps you to reconstruct someone else's attention, might actually make a simpler explanation for some of the prior findings. When you reconstruct the complicated abstract ideas uh, in someone else's mind, for example, in the standard task, uh, does Sally believe her sandwich is in basket A or basket B? Uh, you certainly are also reconstructing what Sally is paying attention to at that moment. So here we have a, a potentially interesting perspective on previous results. This region may uh, participate in reconstructing someone else's state of attention. Just as the uh, TPJ may reconstruct Kevin's state of attention, maybe it's also constantly reconstructing your own state of attention. It does light up when you switch your attention around, as Corbetta and his colleagues found. I'm proposing that the awareness that you attribute to Kevin is essentially a guess or a model about Kevin's state of attention. You're reconstructing Kevin's state of attention. This system in the brain uh, models the attention of others, which helps you to monitor and predict their behavior. And I'm proposing that this system in the brain uh, does the same with respect to yourself. Uh, in that hypothesis, in order for you to compute, I am aware of this, I am aware of that, you recruit the same system in the brain that computes, Kevin is aware of this, Kevin is aware of that. If this proposal is correct, then disrupting this area should cause some disruption in one's own awareness. Now, we're just beginning experiments on temporary reversible disruption here. Uh, and I don't have any data yet on that experiment to show you. Uh, but there are interesting results from the clinical literature on the effect of damage around here. Let me give you a very brief overview of something called hemispatial neglect. Damage to the right hemisphere can cause left neglect. Patients act as though they have lost all awareness of objects in the left side of space. Uh, they 
lose all awareness that there even is a left side of space. Curiously, information can still get in. People's actions and choices uh, can be influenced. <clears throat> the brain is still processing information from over here. <clears throat> and the processing can be very high level. Visual areas all the way up the scale are active, but the patient is unaware of it. A damage to the left hemisphere typically doesn't cause neglect. The reason for the asymmetry is not definitely known. There are several competing theories. The most common and simplest theory goes as follows. Something in the brain uh, must be necessary for awareness of space and objects. That processor is present in both hemispheres. The left hemisphere processor is somehow weaker and can only represent the right side of space. The right hemisphere processor is stronger or more developed and can represent uh, both sides of space. When the left hemisphere processor is damaged, you're all right. The other side takes over. But when instead the right processor is damaged, you're in trouble. Only one side of space is covered, and you lack the machinery to uh, properly process the left side of space. Hence, a loss of awareness over here. That's the most common theory anyway. You may wonder why I'm bringing up the topic of neglect. Historically, uh, neglect was considered to be a deficit of the parietal lobe a disruption of attention, uh, of the ability to control attention, to direct attention to the spaces around the body. With modern imaging methods, when you look at neglect patients, yes, sometimes uh, damage to the parietal lobe can cause neglect. Uh, so can damage to the frontal lobe. But the brain area most associated with the most profound clinical neglect is the TPJ. The TPJ on the right side of the brain, a controversial finding. The TPJ is supposed to be a social area. Uh, and neglect is supposed to be in the parietal lobe. So what is this craziness? This finding is so inconvenient uh, from a traditional point of view that it's been ignored for about 20 years. But the results are clear. The literature is clear. Uh, neglect occurs most often and most severely with damage here this area of the brain, when damaged, disrupts your ability to construct your own awareness of objects on the left. Our explanation, given our data, we suggest that the TPJ helps address the question, is person Y aware of thing X? Is Kevin aware of the object next to him? Uh, am I myself aware of the object next to me? Awareness, in this view, is a computed feature. And the TPJ is a central node in that computation. Okay, there may be other nodes, and we're exploring that. Now, I'd like to try to get at the same hypothesis uh, about awareness from a different perspective. When you look at an apple, your visual system encodes and then combines many sensory features. The apple is green. It's more or less round, it's moving, perhaps rolling to the right. Each of these features is represented as information uh, computed in various regions of the brain. Binding of stimulus features together, uh, such, that, uh, such as color, shape, and, and motion, into a single larger representation has been studied intensively, especially uh, in the domain of vision. I'm suggesting that the property of awareness is another such computed feature, a description, a chunk of information that can be bound to the larger object file. When you introspect, that is to say, when your cognitive machinery consults uh, this inner information, it is informed not only that the apple is present and green and round, but also that an awareness, your awareness, is attached to these features. Damage the brain machinery for computing color, and the color feature disappears. The representation becomes colorblind. Damage the machinery for computing awareness, and the awareness feature disappears. Your brain processes the apple, but without awareness. Well, the object of your awareness does not need to be an apple, of course. Instead of visual information, you could fill in the blank here with information about a sound, 
or an idea or an emotion, information about who you are as a person or a memory of something that happens to you. The content of consciousness goes here. Uh, in this account, awareness itself is a descriptive chunk of information computed partly by the TPJ that can be linked to many other types of information. All right, but why would the brain construct uh, such a strange chunk of information unless it represents something of use in the real world? The brain constructs color information because it represents something real, the reflected spectrum of objects. Uh, but what does this information describe? The theory could be put in a sentence. Awareness is a description of attention. Attention is a real item with real physical properties. Awareness is uh, an informational depiction of it, a simulation, a model that allows for prediction. Attention is a complicated mechanistic way in which neural signals compete and interact in the brain. Uh, some signals win the competition, some are suppressed. The signals that win rise up, have a greater impact on behavior. Attention is self-organizing. It's a signal processing method. It's something the brain does. Awareness in this theory is a kind of rough sketch of attention. The brain's schematic way of depicting it, of monitoring it, of helping to predict it, of capturing the essentials of it. Now, awareness has been described in many ways. An ineffable stuff, a kind of ectoplasm, a non-physical experience, a feeling. Some people describe it as emanating from a source from the head, emanating out to a target, perhaps flowing out of the eyes to focus on something. The belief that awareness <clears throat> can flow out of the eyes is incredibly culturally robust. So what is all that? Why are all those properties commonly associated with awareness? In the present theory, all those magical properties attributed to awareness are easy ways to caricature a mechanistic process in the brain, the process of attention, the process by which circuitry in the brain focuses on and deeply processes select information. Awareness equals an attention schema. Awareness is a model of attention. Now, I want to tell you a story. I had a friend who was a clinical psychologist. He told me about a patient of his. This patient was delusional and thought that he had a squirrel inside his head. Well, obviously, I don't have a picture of that patient, so I picked some poor random fool to illustrate the point. This patient was certain about the squirrel in his head. No argument could convince him otherwise. He might agree that the condition made no physical or logical sense, uh, but his squirrelness transcended physics and logic. The squirrel was simply there. He knew it. Instead of Descartes' famous uh, cogito ergo sum, this man's slogan could have been squirrel ergo squirrel, or to be linguistically accurate, uh, sayurida ergo sayurida. Now, the, the squirrel in the man's head poses two intellectual problems. And we, we might call them the easy problem and the hard problem. The easy problem is to figure out how a brain might arrive at that conclusion with such certainty. The brain is an information processing device. When a person introspects, his brain is accessing inter internal data. Right? That man's brain had evidently uh, constructed a rich, nuanced description of a squirrel in his head, complete with bushy tail, claws, beady eyes. The cognitive machinery accessed that description and incorrectly assigned a high certainty of reality to it. All right, so much for the easy problem. But then there's the hard problem. How can a brain, a mere assemblage of neurons, result in an actual squirrel inside the man's head? Right? Where do the, how is the squirrel produced? Where does the fur come from? Where do the claws and the tail and the beady little eyes come from? Now, that is a very hard problem indeed. Um, it seems physically impossible. No known process, no logical sequence can lead from neuronal activity to an actual squirrel. 
Uh, if we all shared that man's delusion, if it were a universal fixture of the human brain, if it were evolutionarily built into us, we would be scientifically stumped by that hard problem. We would introspect, find the squirrel in us with all its special properties, assign certainty to its existence, describe it to each other, agree collectively uh, that we all have it. <laughs> and yet we would have no idea how to explain the jump from neuronal circuitry to squirrel. Well, of course, there is no hard problem because there is no actual squirrel. The man's brain contains a description of a squirrel, not an actual squirrel. It's information. When you consider it, an actual squirrel would be an extremely poor explanation for the man's beliefs and behavior. Right? There is no obvious mechanism to get from an actual squirrel inserted into his skull somehow to his introspective decision, belief, certainty, insistence, and report about it. I suppose in a philosophical way, the squirrel exists, but it exists as information. It exists as simulation. I suggest that when the word squirrel is replaced by the phrase conscious experience, the logic is the same. We're certain we have it. We agree on its basic properties. Uh, but where does the experience, the inner feeling, come from? How can neurons possibly create it? How can we jump from brain to awareness? The properties of consciousness, the fur, the tail, and the claws of it, so to speak, the feeling, the raw experienceness, its ethereal presence inside our heads, these properties may be explainable as components of a descriptive model. The brain contains descriptions of these things. Brains are good at uh, constructing descriptions of things. Now, in the case of the man who thought he had a squirrel in his head, we can dismiss his certainty as a delusion. The delusion serves no adaptive function. It's harmful. Thank goodness few of us have that delusion. I am decidedly not suggesting that conscious experience is a delusion. Right? In the present theory, conscious experience is not a harmful error, but instead an adaptive, useful internal model. But like the squirrel in the head, it's a description of a thing, not the thing itself. Awareness is a schematic description of attention. In many ways, the study of consciousness reminds me of the study of evolution prior to Charles Darwin. People saw this incredible diversity of life uh, and didn't know how or why. Uh, how did these animals and plants get to be so well suited to the things that they do? Uh, most explanations involved magical thinking. Then Darwin proposed uh, the theory of natural selection. Many people these days don't realize, but natural selection was not immediately accepted by the scientific community. All right, Darwin's book in 1859 was famous, but natural selection as the explanation was not widely accepted in biology until the early 1900s. One reason uh, is that Darwin's answer seemed too trivial like an intellectual trick. It was subtle and facile and didn't seem to have the right emotional or philosophical weight. It wasn't the spiritual magic uh, that people at that time were looking for. It took a while for the larger scientific community to realize that such a simple trick actually did explain the biological world. I think something similar is happening with respect to consciousness. Almost all theories of consciousness involve magical thinking. Okay? Even people who insist they are scientific uh, that their work has nothing to do with magic. Even these people are engaged in magical thinking. Why? Because almost all people start by assuming that there is a squirrel in the head. That is to say, most people assume that there really is an inner feeling, a non-physical experience, the awareness aura. And now, how do neurons produce it? But that already is magical thinking. First you accept a magical, non-physical experience, then you try to explain it. With that first step, you're stuck. There is no answer to the question because the question is wrong. There is no squirrel in the head. You don't have to explain how neurons produce the squirrel. There is only information that describes the state of squirrel in the head. That is to say, there is information that describes an inner non-physical feeling. Given that information, the computing machinery can access it, summarize it, assign a high computed level of certainty to it, jump up and down insisting on it, organize a conference on the topic. 
This, this is the hardest concept of them all. We have to get past the magic. As long as we cling to the magical thinking, we will not get to the solution. We have to let go of the magic. There is no non-physical magic. There is an informational description of non-physical magic. Information that describes being aware of something. There is computation that leads up uh, to that description, and there is computation based on that description. I just think that when an information processing device, such as the brain, introspects, that is to say, accesses inner data, right, and on that, on that basis concludes that it has physically unexplainable magic inside of it, the fundamental question is not how does it produce actual magic, right? Instead, there really is only one fundamental question. It's an evolutionary question. What is the adaptive advantage to that system of constructing that particular information? What is the utility of that information to that brain? Well, the attention schema theory explains exactly that. Usually, when the brain constructs descriptive information, it's because it stands for something that's useful to monitor or predict. Brains sort their data using a neural process of attention. The brain also constructs a descriptive model, a sketch, a constantly updated schema to monitor and predict attention. The schema depicts an agent focusing on information, seizing on it, experiencing it, being aware of it. Awareness is an attention schema. Attention is fundamental to brains. As I said, attention is basically the dynamics of signal competition. At heart, attention is lateral inhibition. Uh, neural, uh, neuronal signals compete. One signal rises up and inhibits other signals. The brain as a result, is focusing its resources on that one dominant signal, and that signal dominates behavior. That method of sorting data is present, at least in some form, in all animals uh, with a nervous system. It's evolutionarily old. If a brain uses this fundamental processing method, uh, then it also has some adaptive use for monitoring and modeling it, for having an internal model of attention. This is control theory. Now, I don't know when in evolution a really sophisticated attention schema evolved, but in this theory, awareness, the attention schema, may be present in some form in many animals. I would presume at some later point in evolution, uh, this internal model, this attention schema, became useful for monitoring and predicting the behavior of others as well. Uh, and that brings in that whole social cognition uh, topic. So that now uh, the human brain has uh, an overlap between the areas of the brain that seem to participate in attributing awareness to others and the areas of the brain that, when damaged, disrupt one's own awareness. So an overlap between those two uh, mechanisms, attributing awareness to others, attributing awareness to oneself. Thank you.